Okay, so um, for this week, uh, we're going to be talking about um, cellular respiration and fermentation. This is a continuation of where we were at the end of class last time, where we were um, uh, talking about some, uh, some chemistry. Um, and now we're going to use um, and build on and expand that understanding of chemistry um, to, um, to help us to understand um, how cells... Yeah, extract energy from organic compounds, use energy to drive reactions, and to run the chemistry of life. Um, uh, so, um, where, actually here, let me, I'm going to move this around so we can see, uh, so we can have a little bit more space for this. Um, so, uh, there are a couple equations, and I apologize for those of you over there that can't quite see this, but there are a couple equations that I had up on the board last time. One is that um, this thing called delta G, which is Gibbs free energy, equals delta H, which is our enthalpy or potential energy. Um, minus temperature times delta S. Um, temperature is just temperature, um, and delta S is um, what's called entropy kind of disorder. Entropy is a super complicated concept um, that uh, I still can't quite fully wrap my head around all the time. Um, and then this is called uh, free energy. Um, if uh, so, so energy is always conserved, um, but one way to think about free energy is actually to think about useful energy is a term that sometimes um, gets used. And so things that have a lot of free energy or have a high potential energy have, or have energy that's in a compact, tight, organized, useful form. And then as time goes on, energy disperses, and, and that's sort of what entropy, and one way to think about entropy is energy disperses out either as chemical bonds are broken and the energy gets released as heat, so a drop in potential energy, or in some other way the system sort of finds ways to disperse molecules around in it or make those molecules that are in it have more ability to move and shake themselves about. Um, so energy is conserved, that's the first law of thermodynamics, but in a closed system, entropy increases always over time. Um, and that can be because, again, heat is a sort of um, useless, in a sense, or less useful form of energy than, um, uh, than uh, chemical bonds because that energy becomes dispersed once it becomes heat. Um, or uh, molecules being able to jostle around or mixing together um, in general increases the entropy of a system. <clears throat> um, and so for, uh, for this week, we're going to be talking about enzymes and coupling of reactions um, and introducing mitochondria um, as one of the organelles inside cells that are critical for um, generation of ATP and energy in cells. Um, and then talking about um, a little bit more about ener energetic. We're going to talk about energetics today. Um, and then a, by the end of today or beginning of class on Friday, um, begin talking about mitochondria, return again to energetics and entropy and enthalpy in some different forms on, fr on Friday. Um, and then also on Friday, we'll talk about um, the different sort of modules of cellular respiration. Um, for the quiz on Friday, you need to read through a couple things. Um, um, basically, all of Chapter 8, especially 8.3, this is all on the topics guide, um, and also um, uh, the first section of Chapter 9. Um, uh, and the first section of Chapter 9 really captures everything that you have to have memorized about cellular respiration, or at least it summarizes nicely everything that you have to have memorized about cellular respiration. Um, there were some, a lot of questions that I got um, in the homework um, as people were working on the homework about, uh, especially about like why oil and water don't mix. This was something that um, uh, came up and, uh, and I think I still have the slide somewhere over here um, uh, for that. Um, no, maybe I, maybe I don't have it right now. Um, uh, where um, oil, oil and water don't mix, um, and why it is that oil and water don't mix. Actually, I do have the slide. It's just um, uh, back here. Um, and here you are. Um, 
So salt and water mix because um, the, the water can, um, uh, the partial positive charges on the hydrogen and the partial negative charges on the um, oxygen um, can surround and get attracted to and do uh, and sort of substitute for the hydrogen bonding that water makes. Um, and so as salt and water mix, the water molecules can dance with the salt ions the same way that the water molecules can dance with each other. Um, and so when salt and water are next to each other, there's this sort of a, a freedom, three-dimensional freedom of partners to dance around with and move around with and constant um, uh, you know, uh, square dance thing going on that water can do, um, which has a lot of entropy associated with it. Um, and so for mixing things, I have some demos to, to do. So this is normal food coloring. Um, and if I put it in here like this, um, so it actually kind of settles to the bottom because it's denser than the water. And we could probably sit here and wait all class period and it wouldn't fully mix. But if we came back like tomorrow or in a week or whatever, then what would happen? Where would it be? Yeah, like just green everywhere. Actually, it's starting to get pretty close to that now. And then I can just shake it up, uh, speed up the mixing process. Now it's there. It's all mixed together. It's going to stay mixed pretty much forever. Um, <clears throat> and the reason um, is that there are more ways. Or, uh, so one, um, one way to think about entropy is um, the number of ways to arrange a system um, or freedom to move around. Um, so the water molecules, the, this, this, this dye um, is made up of stuff that has a, a lot of polarity on it. Um, I actually don't know exactly what the full composition of this dye is. It's probably a mix of a few things. Um, but the, the molecules in that dye can form hydrogen bonds or ionic bonds with water, just like salt can, and just like water can with itself, or like ammonia can with water, or ethanol can with water, or whatever. Um, and so as a result of that, um, the water doesn't lose, the water molecules don't really lose any internal freedom when they start mixing together with the dye. Um, and they can still trade and in the dye, another way to think about that is the dye molecules can just jump right into the square dancing with the water and, um, and continue this movement. So the water doesn't sacrifice any sort of internal entropy of the molecules of the water um, when it's interacting with the dye. Um, this is in contrast, for example, to water when it's on the surface of, of, of water. The, so this thin surface of water at the top where it interfaces with the air, those water molecules actually have a lot of tension and um, are a lot stiffer. Uh, there's, a, there's some surface tension that water has. Um, and that's because those molecules at the surface now don't have three dimensions of partners to trade with. And so they're sort of stuck and they have internally to themselves a little bit less entropy. Does that make sense so far? Questions about that? And then so, okay, so the obvious next thing is, so this is canola oil and water, right? And right now they're separated. Um, I can shake them up and that, at a sort of macroscopic level, increases the entropy because I've shuffled things together. But every place where there's a little bit of oil and a little bit of water next to each other, those water molecules are, have, have sacrificed some of their own sort of internal entropy or their own internal ability to move around. And so um, that adds up to a lot of entropy loss in this big volume. And so over the course of the next, it takes a little while, um, uh, but over the course of the next uh, 40 minutes or so, um, that will settle down to minimize this, the, the area of contact. Right now there's a lot, almost, the, almost all the water molecules have oil near them. And so almost all the water molecules don't have partners to hydrogen bond with. Um, but uh, over the course of the next 40 minutes, that'll settle back into where it was when we got here um, with an oil and water mix that are separate from each other. Um, and so that will, um, uh, and so the reason for that is the sort of entropy of the water molecules on an individual molecule by molecule basis and their ability to move freely um, around and, and continue this sort of uh, square dancing, changing partners, moving and, and, uh, and uh, trading around that they're constantly doing. Does that make sense? I know there were a lot of questions about that on the homework. Um, are, are there still questions? Yeah, sure. Oh, can you read the entropy part? 
Yeah, well, so, so it's, it's entropy is, there, there's actually, entropy is, is quite complicated. There's entropy of individual molecules. So each individual molecule has its own, like, how much freedom it has to move. And then there's also entropy at a large scale macroscopic level. And they both matter. And so, again, when I shake this up, the large scale macroscopic entropy actually goes up. But every individual water molecule is more restricted in its individual movement. So each individual water molecule actually has lower entropy. And that adds up to um, more of a loss in entropy than I gained by mixing. So I gained some macroscopic entropy by mixing, but I lost some molecule by molecule entropy of the water. Um, yeah, did that? Yeah, yeah. Quite other questions about that? Yeah, sure. Um, it's because, so if you have a water molecule surrounded by a whole bunch of oil or that has a lot of, that, that many of the sides of it have oil on it, then that water molecule can't make hydrogen bonds. And so, so if we go back to, like when the water molecules can make hydrogen bonds, then they're able to move freely and constantly exchange. And, and so they're, they, they um, let me see if I have a picture of ice back here. So, um, yeah. So in ice, water is very well organized, and um, uh, the water forms uh, an organized structure that actually takes up more space than liquid water. Um, but in liquid water, it's not just frozen in one configuration. They're constantly moving and trading and breaking hydrogen bonds and making new hydrogen bonds and breaking new hydrogen bonds and making new hydrogen bonds, making new hydrogen bonds um, uh, at, at a stupidly high rate, um, uh, like, um, I don't know, uh, millions of times per second or something an individual water molecule is making and breaking hydrogen bonds. And that means that there's more possible arrangements that it can go through um, at, uh, um, as, it's, as it's got all these, when it's surrounded by other water molecules. If we stick this water um, in a situation where it's sur surrounded by oil, then as, then whatever sides of the water are in contact with the oil is one less space where it can make and break these hydrogen bonds and therefore and so it can't have this internal freedom to move about yeah yeah sure so then the water molecules that are able to move around freely have more entropy yes exactly yeah the ones that the water molecules that are surrounded by other water molecules or surrounded by other polar substances like ethanol, which has um, a, a, an OH group that we'll talk about. Um, uh, um, actually, maybe, um, uh, no, I don't have the slide here. We'll, talk, we'll get back to that in a bit. Um, but, uh, oops, yeah. Um, well, I mean, we can, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, you could, you, so one, the, 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 um, uh, the reason that um, water doesn't um, water doesn't dissolve in oil is actually we're a little bit behind, so I didn't want, want to do the quiz. But um, it's um, highly organized at the contact point with the oil, um, and so when those when you have a thin layer of contact, that's not so bad. But when you mix it all up, then there's contact everywhere, and all of those water molecules are forced to be organized. Yeah, sure. So they says oil is just like a quiz question. It was going to be, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So B is the right answer for this. This, this yeah, sorry. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, this was going to be a quiz question. A pop, this is going to be a pop quiz question to do in the class, but we're running a little short on time. Um, it's up on the slides, and you can look through and think about why, um, why B is the right answer and the others are wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, this, actually, some people noticed this in the slides that were posted and also asked about that as well. Um, but yeah, this was, this was not actually not part of today's slides. This was um, last week's slides. Um, anyway, sorry. So, other questions about this? Okay, so um, <clears throat> yeah, so like I was saying, for this week we're going to be talking about enzymes and coupling of reactions and mitochondria um, uh, today, and then um, really a lot about energy today and beginning tomorrow. Um, and then we'll be talking about the four modules of cellular respiration, which you'll get an overview of between now and Friday when you read section 9.1, chapter the first section of chapter 9 in the book, um, in preparation for the quiz. 
Um, and, uh, and then we will talk about after the quiz on Friday um, and possibly even a little bit more on Monday as well. Um, but this is sort of the plan to get us through Friday and maybe the first part of Monday. Is, these are the different things that we're going to talk about. Um, okay, and so uh, the, the first of those topics is, is, is thinking about thinking more about this idea of free energy, potential energy, entropy, um, and, um, and, uh, and chemical reactions in general. Uh, and so um, uh, who's heard of ATP before? Okay, most people, if you've taken a biology class, you've probably heard of ATP. It's um, uh, the, the main source of energy that cells use. Um, and the goal of cellular respiration, which is the topic for Friday and maybe a little bit at the beginning of Monday, is essentially to make ATP so that, we can, so that our cells can use it to do other things. And the doing of other, and so before we talk about how cells make ATP. We're going to spend most of the rest of the time today talking about why cells need ATP. Um, so ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It's actually the same molecule that is part of RNA. If we took this OH and converted it into an H, then that would be um, deoxy ATP, which could then get incorporated into DNA um, as the letter A in RNA or DNA. Um, we'll get back to that next week when we talk about DNA replication a little bit and as we talk about RNA and, and so on um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, but ATP essentially, or, or adenosine nucleotides, so the general form for all of the things shown here are adenosine nucleotides. Um, they have a sugar that has five carbons. Um, they, get numbered one pri they get numbered one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime, um, which will come back up when we talk about DNA replication. There's also a base which has its own numbering scheme of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever, um, that don't have the primes on it. Um, and then phosphates hanging off of the number five carbon. Um, so this five prime carbon here has some phosphates hanging off. And so adenosine triphosphate or ATP is this molecule here where there are three phosphates hanging off of it. That's what triphosphate. Um, you also find in cells adenosine diphosphate or ADP that has two phosphates hanging off of it, um, and adenosine monophosphate, AMP, where there's just a single phosphate hanging off of it. Or there's one other form that it sometimes takes um, that can be a signal that's used in cells called cyclic AMP, where um, this phosphate is a phosphorus with a bunch of oxygens around it. If one of those oxygens makes a covalent bond back to this carbon and kicks out this OH, Actually, I think it's the other way around. This oxygen here but covalently bonds this phosphorus and kicks out that oxygen, but whatever. Either way, if you get this, this sort of, this, it, this version where you have this cycle or this ring where the phosphate bonds back to the three prime carbon in addition to its already existing bond to the five prime carbon, then we have this extra ring structure built into it and we call, and because it has an additional ring, we call that cyclic AMP. So those are kind of the three forms of uh, adenosine uh, nucleotides. Um, I, this slide, I should mention, this slide I added late, so if you download slides in advance, it's on, there, it's on Canvas now, but it wasn't up there before. Um, and so we can think of this in terms of energy. So if we're, if we're doing, in cells, everything happens in water. Um, so uh, so in, so in, our, in our cell, in water, there's a certain amount of, um, of free energy present in this ATP. And one reaction that ATP can do so is to do something like this, where it gets converted into ADP plus this PI means inorganic phosphate. So one of those three phosphate groups gets kicked off um, and floats around. Now it's not connected to an organic molecule, so we call it an inorganic phosphate. Um, and there are sort of two features of this reaction. Number one is that delta G is negative. Um, we'll get back to about, it's, it's approximately equal to, um, 
minus um, 14,000 joules per mole. Um, so a mole is 6 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of ATP. And so if I have 6 times 20 to the 3rd molecules of ATP and I break them down into ADP and phosphate, then I will release 14,000 joules. And I forget the exact definition of a joule. I think it's enough energy to push a 1 kilogram weight 1 meter or something like that. So I can push 14,000 1 kilogram weights 1 meter um, with, that eight, uh, with, with that 6 times 10 to the 23rd molecules molecules of ATP um, by breaking them down into ADP and phosphate. So this here, this is our delta G of our reaction. And then this here, this is um, sometimes, uh, this, this is uh, our, our delta G of activation or activation energy. And so it takes ATP is moderately stable in water. It takes a little bit of a bump, a little bit of a kick, to get that ATP to lose that phosphate. And so there's a little bit of an activation and energy needed for that. Yeah, questions about that? OK. Um, from here, we could have another activation energy and another drop, again, of about 14. Um, 14 kilojoules per mole um, to convert this ADP plus phosphate into AMP plus two phosphates now sticking out. Um, there's another kick that I, there's another reaction that actually has a way higher activation energy, goes way up here and like onto the second floor a little bit. Um, that converts this into cyclic AMP plus two phosphates. Um, the delta G of that is somewhere in the neighborhood of minus uh, 25 or so kilojoules per mole. So, um, so there's, and then our, our delta G activation is very big for this. Okay, so questions about that? Yeah, I see a couple hands up. Uh, I saw yours first, so go ahead. Okay, so the delta G is negative. Right. But like graphically, is that how you would show that still? Because there's Well, yeah, I guess I guess I should just say that the del I should just say delta G is 25. This this the size of this is 25 kilojoules per mole, and so if we're going from here to here, it's negative. If we're going from here to there, it's positive. Same thing with this. So, so I guess I'll, I'll let the diagram indicate whether it's positive or negative. And then the direct, so going from here to there is minus. Going, if we went backwards from here up to here, that would be a plus 14. Yeah. So then, if it was, if that was a negative 25 kilojoules per mole, is converting cyclic AMP to uh, NSC triphosphate, is that a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous reaction? That is um, a, Great question. Um, so um, the definition of a spontaneous reaction um, is one where delta G is negative. So if I'm going from ATP to here, then that is spontaneous. The other way around is not spontaneous. Is not spontaneous. Exactly right. Um, the, um, there's some nuances to that that we may or may not have time to get into next time. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, so that is, um, that is a spontaneous reaction. But there are, there are no, there's another feature that's important to think about here, um, which is um, the, I didn't quite draw this right. This, should be a, this line should be a little bit lower than this, but a little bit higher than that. Um, this, um, this reaction, while it is spontaneous, there's a, big connect, there's a big hurdle to get over. You need a whole lot of energy to get the molecules to line up just the right way to go from ATP to cyclic AMP. And so while it's spontaneous, it might never happen um, because there's so much, energy, it's so much activation energy associated with it. Um, OK, so, um, so if I, so um, spontaneous reaction, delta G is negative, will happen 
eventually, where eventually might be a very long amount of time. Um, but this tells us nothing about, this has no information about when. So if I put some ATP in some water and leave it for a month and come back, um, what is it eventually going to be? I guess actually, so let's, let me pause here and say, okay, so um, uh, let's actually make this a, a, a discussion for, for people to think about and discuss with their, their groups for like a minute or so. Um, if you put ATP in water, leave it, for, leave it for a month and come back, what are you mostly going to see there? So let's just kind of take two minutes, discuss with your groups, think about what you think the most likely thing you're eventually going to end up with is. Yeah. ATP. <laughs> I notice you look confused. Oh, no, I always look confused. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. All right, that's fine. Let me know if you have questions. It's the downside of being up front. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? Um, there's, there's, an, there's, um, it's at room temperature, so there's some energy in the system, not, a ton, not necessarily a ton, but we're waiting, we're waiting a long time too, so we're gonna let this get to an equilibrium state. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, we'll all announce that, but yes, you should assume it's not, not absolute zero. Like there's some energy there, and we're waiting a long enough time that this will get to equilibrium. Yeah, it's at room temperature or something. Um, okay, so uh, it, I, I know I think that the groups were still in the middle of discussing some things, but um, but uh, so if we wait a week or a month or whatever, and this is not this is at room temperature or body temperature or something, so there's some energy in the system. Where is our equilibrium eventually going to end up, mostly or completely at? Um, yeah, sure. Um, we discussed. We thought it would be most likely at AMP yeah it's the most stable form it's the lowest energy state um, we um, so remember when when Delta G is negative that's a spontaneous reaction and it will eventually happen it might take a long time at room temperature actually for this it actually doesn't take too long for ATP to self hydrolyze if you put it in water um, uh, but yeah yeah exactly it'll, it'll get to the, the lowest energy state is where it'll get to um, the more we heat it up the faster it gets to that equilibrium but heating it up probably isn't going to do us any good in terms of if we want cyclic AMP right um, so one thing See, so let's buy myself a little bit more board space here for a second. <clears throat> um, so, what? Oh, goodness. Okay, good. Sometimes it goes forever. Um, this reaction. Um, has a delta G of. Uh, minus 25 or so kilojoules per mole. Um, so it is spontaneous. Um, so kind of theoretically, if you left ATP in water, you would get there. But the problem is, before you ever get to cyclic AMP plus two phosphates, you've already landed at this other low energy state that is even lower energy, so you're never getting back over to cyclic AMP, right? Um, does that kind of make sense? Um, it actually uh, just sort of it officially is possible for cyclic AMP to convert directly into AMP and break that bond. Um, that's that would be another reaction that would happen that has like a, a delta G of minus I don't know whatever it adds up to like minus three or four kilocalories per mole kilojoules per mole. Um, so this is a spontaneous reaction, but it never happens in a cell, and it never happens primarily. Um, well, and it kind of never happens for two reasons. One is there's another reaction that is gets us to an even lower energy state. Um, so here, this this never happens um, on its own. 
even though it is sort of uh, spontaneous by definition. It is spontaneous. Um, but if I put a catalyst in, an enzyme, that takes this activation energy and makes this activation energy very small, If I leave this alone with the catalyst for a week or a month or whatever, then eventually I do still get here. That's the lowest energy state. That's where we're going to settle up at equilibrium. Um, but in biology, the other word for equilibrium is death. Um, and so um, eventually you will get here and it'll even break down further than that. But if I put this enzyme in, this catalyst in, that decreases the activation energy specifically for this reaction, then in the next second, or in the next tenth of a second, what is the most likely thing to happen to that ATP now? Any thoughts about what's most likely to happen now? Sure, yeah. It'll go to camp. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, with a catalyst enzyme, a protein that that lowers the activation energy of that reaction, um, it will actually then in the next second, um, this will happen right now. Come back in a week and you'll still have AMP. Um, but for at least a few seconds, you'll have some cyclic AMP that maybe you, your cell needs to do some, some other chemistry with. Um, yeah, sure. It's not. It's not. Um, cyclic AMP to ATP is not spontaneous. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's, um, it, you, you would need to put in, you would need to have an ex we'll talk about maybe in a second how you get okay. external energy source. Um, I see some more hands up. Yeah. So when you're getting the energy for the activation energy, is it like a slow process over time or is it, does it get all of the energy at once? Right. So what, it, what the enzyme does is it grabs hold of the ATP and sort of twists it into just the right form and then also maybe grabs hold of a water molecule and brings them together in just the right, in just the right angle that that reaction becomes the thing that is, that is mo easiest for the molecules to do. Um, and so it's called stabilizing a transition state. Um, there, um, uh, 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 we can, uh, I, I can try to remember to post some examples of stabilized transition states for this. The book describes it in sort of general terms as well, this idea of stabilizing a transition state. But um, without the enzyme, it's, you, it, it, you have to be really, really lucky to get the ATP in just the right shape that it will form a, a cyclic AMP. But with the enzyme, the enzyme sort of bends it naturally into that position so that it does so that the so that the easiest thing for it to do in the next millisecond is to make cyclic AMP. What about if it's going from the ATP to like the ADP where it's just normal? Yeah, so there might be an enzyme that would catalyze that reaction as well. Um, that happens kind of pretty quickly on its own. Um, but there are but we'll talk in just a second about reasons why you would want to do that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, so three, th ATP, three phosphate, yeah, the, the three phosphates stuck together is three negative charges stuck together, so it's like a well, spring. Ah, uh, yeah, once, so, well, when you separate them, now they're able to, to go away from each other, and, um, and that releases the energy, and now, and now it creates, and now that sort of is, is a type of diffusion and dispersion, so that is an entropy th uh, function, yeah. Which of the we, um, which process would the enzyme presently um, have it more readily? Um, oh well, with the enzyme, so uh, in um, so cells operate on time scales of fractions of a second, and so within fractions of a second, when that enzyme's around and active, the cyclic AMP is what's going to be made. So like the what kind of signal is that like what now? well, um, so cyclic AMP can bind to other proteins and twist their shape and change the way that they function, and we'll get back to that. Kind of in a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions about that? Um, okay, so um, 
Let's see, I'm running out of board space here. All right, so let's say I have one other reaction that I'm interested in doing, which is to take a glycine amino acid glycine and an alanine amino acid and stick those together. Um, it turns out that doing that into a, what's called a, a, into um, a short protein that's just made up of two amino acids stuck together where you have a glycine covalently attached to an alanine with something called a peptide bond that we'll return to in unit two. Um, that reaction going this way has a positive delta G associated with it, is non-spontaneous. Um, I, I don't remember the exact value for it, but let's just say here that our delta G is something like um, 10 kilojoules per mole. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so I guess actually, first of all, one thing to do is, um, is before, before we talk about this, um, just by itself, our enzyme the first enzyme here um, uh, the enzyme chose the reaction so enzymes choose reactions that happen in cells in a cell there are millions upon millions of possible chemical reactions that can happen at any point. Enzymes lower the activation energy of some. We think we often, they're often described as catalysts, but realize really they are reaction choosers. They are, they are um, uh, uh, little molecular machines that decide which reaction, which chemistry is going to happen, which chemistry is not. That's, that's the first thing um, that enzymes do, or so the first part of their function. Um, the second thing to think about with enzymes is so if we have glycine plus alanine and gly to going to glycine and alanine, is that going to happen on its own spontaneously? No, it doesn't, does, doesn't happen on its own spontaneously. But if we, um, um, but what we could do is we could imagine a reaction that, that is like this, ATP plus glycine plus alanine goes to ADP plus phosphate plus this uh, oops, glycine alanine combination covalently attached. Um, so let's take, let's take just three minutes and write down with your group and think is this reaction, two questions. First of all, is this reaction spontaneous? Second of all, without a catalyst, is it likely to happen? So is it spontaneous? Is it... Oh. Yeah, yeah, sorry, um, write, this, write this down on a piece of paper with everyone's name to turn in. Yeah. Yeah, write this down on some paper with everybody's name on it, too. Um, okay, about 30 seconds or so to finish up your discussion of these two questions.
Okay, um, so you should finish up, your dis as you're finishing up your discussion, we'll come back together in the last five minutes or so of class and talk about this um, as a group. So, um, first of all, uh, is this reaction spontaneous? So remember the definition of spontaneous, delta G is negative. Kind of means it will happen eventually, although that's a little bit misleading because, like we saw before, the cyclic, the production of ATP, conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP is legally fits the definition of spontaneous, but in reality never happens for because there's a stupidly high activation energy and because there's an, there's an, another reaction that ATP can do that gives off even more energy. Um, but nonetheless. By the legal definition of spontaneity and spontaneous reaction, is this combined reaction a spontaneous one? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Yeah, sure. I would say, yeah, we, we agreed yes because um, the, overall, the overall delta G would be negative if, if the, um, like the breaking up of the ATP releases the energy that's necessary for the other reaction. Right, yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, yeah, so the ATP, the ATP part of the reaction gives us minus 14 kilojoules per mole. Um, and, then, um, and then the other reaction consumes 10 kilojoules per mole. And so if you add that together, you get that this, this combined reaction is spontaneous. Will, if, if it does happen, it releases 4 kilojoules per mole. Um, any thoughts about whether it's going to happen? Yeah, sure. Right, yeah, that's, um, so, uh, yeah, that's, I think, I, again, sort of analogous to this before, and in fact, um, this in particular, you would have to be just, like, ridiculously lucky to have an ATP and a glycine and an alanine bump into each other in just the right way, where this reaction in combination is what happens. So, in fact, yeah, it's, the activation energy of this is going to be huge. We're going to have a huge um, activation energy. And in addition to that, what, if, 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 if I just put some ATP, some glycine, and some alanine in a, in a bucket of water, what's probably going to happen when I come back next week? What am I going to find? You're going to find more AMP and phosphates, and you're going to find no peptides. Right. Water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, um, AMP and phosphates. You'll first break one and be to ADP, then break the next and be to AMP. But yeah, not, not going to happen on its own. So, so no, it's, it's just, it's, it is never going to happen on its own. Um, so, um, but then this sort of gets us to, I guess I'll leave this, leave this bottom part here so it's a little visible while I bring back my board here. Um, so, um, I guess, yeah, so questions about that? Sure, yeah. Why what? Why, why do we know there are really huge activations? Ah, um, well, so um, in part because, I mean, so I guess, I guess when, whenever you're combining a whole lot of things together, there's always going to be huge activation energy. Um, so uh, in chemistry, two molecules bumping into each other at, at, a, at a moment is possible. Three molecules all coming together at one instant in time is basically always impossible in chemistry. Um, and, so, um, and so that's one way to know that there's a huge activation energy. Um, uh, even if you don't worry about the activation energy, you can also just remember that ATP has another option that has more potential energy release associated with it as well. Um, but so what an enzyme can do though um, is an enzyme can lower this activation energy. Develop a hate, complete hate relationship with the sport. Um, okay, so enzymes choose a reaction and then also enzymes do what we call couple reactions together. 
So, it, and what that accomplishes then is a, a reaction putting glycine and alanine together that by itself requires energy becomes spontaneous when we combine it with the hydrolysis of ATP. And this actually shows like one transition state, sort of like how we might stabilize a transition state and allow this reaction to happen. But overall, the combination of these two reactions happening together is spontaneous. And then if we have an enzyme that lowers this huge activation energy, then it can actually happen. Um, and so that is really sort of the fundamental aspect of all biochemistry, or 90% of biochemistry, is that enzymes choose reactions and couple reactions to make things happen that otherwise wouldn't. So we'll pick back up with that and talk about respiration and mitochondria next time. Um, please turn in the